This video is sponsored by Adam and Eve. Carrying 48 rockets and the most powerful engine of its type outside of the Soviet bloc, this buzzy little fighter could fly just as fast and pack a punch as the early fighter jets of post-World War II. But this ludicrous machine didn't need an airbase, nor even a runway. It could fly vertically and land on its own tail. The project was so successful that the prototype clocked in 60 hours of test flights and dominated Lockheed's rival design. So why was it never built? Meet the world's first true VTOL fighter jet, the Convair XFY Pogo. Innovation in aviation is a high stakes game often entailing a lot of money and resources being spent for unknown outcomes, and very often, abject failure. In that high-stakes world, the Convair XFY-1 delivered a double whammy. Not only was it designed to be a vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL aircraft, but it was also designed to be a tail sitter, a vivid, self-explanatory term that denotes a special kind of plane. It also explains its nickname, the Pogo. VTOL aircraft technology is complex enough, which explains why few examples of it have been successfully produced and proven viable since the mid 20th century. However, a VTOL aircraft that would sit on its tail for takeoff and landing, like Convair's effort, takes that complexity to another level altogether. And you know that makes it perfect for this channel here today. Let's jump into it. VTOL technology was quite the obsession of aviation designers and the military brass during the 20th century. The Convair XFY-1 Pogo was one such effort made after World War II in the pursuit of creating the perfect VTOL combat aircraft that was not only both technologically and financially viable, but also practical. But what made that particular time perfect for the Pogo design? World War II had laid bare just how vulnerable fixed land bases could be to assaults by the enemy from both air and land. Equally exposed were aircraft carriers and other naval vessels, as the Japanese demonstrated on the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Not to mention the threat that their kamikaze pilots posed to the American aircraft carriers and other large ships during the tail end of the war in the Pacific. The United States Navy, still deeply traumatized by the destruction of many of its naval vessels during World War II, was hell-bent on having planes on board that could rapidly intercept enemy attacks. Naval strategists were serious about the feasibility of having VTOL interceptor planes that could achieve just that. The focus was on developing an aircraft that could take off and land vertically on non-aircraft carriers or medium-sized to large ships not designed or equipped to transport conventional aircraft. So we're not talking about seaplanes here. That would also include ships such as destroyers, landing ships, fleet oilers, transports and other similar military vessels. Theoretically, this VTOL interceptor would be able to protect its mothership or join a fleet of VTOL fighters to defend a naval convoy or task force. The time was therefore ripe for the aircraft such as the Convair XFY. The Convair Pogo VTOL plane had a characteristically short, stubby fuselage that made the plane look stocky, even squat. Two near-delta wings and two enormous fins, one ventral and one dorsal, were mounted on the fuselage. This combination of wings and fins created what is known as the cruciform configuration. There was a small castoring wheel attached to the trailing edges of all four of these surfaces. These four small wheels were key as they would allow the aircraft to rest on them when the plane was parked. These wheels were also integral to ensuring the stable base for landing. Once parked, the plane would sit stationary at a 90 degree angle to the ground and with its nose in the air. Hence its designation as a tail sitter aircraft. 
For takeoff, the engines would run up to full power, thereby allowing the aircraft to ascend vertically with the needed thrust. Once it reached a safe altitude, the plane could then be nosed into a more conventional, horizontal flight path. This would need to be done gently and gradually, as too suddenly a switch to the horizontal would render the aircraft aerodynamically unstable. After all, the plane needs wind rushing over the wings to generate lift, and if it suddenly turns sideways whilst travelling vertically, it would just fall out of the sky. During normal flight, control of the aircraft was provided with the help of full-span aerions and large rudders on both the dorsal and ventral fins. Notably, the Convair XFY Pogo was one of the very first aircraft to use hydraulic power flight controls. It's a stable control system used today on nearly all modern fighter and transport aircraft, but which was still very novel back then. For landing, the aircraft would approach its landing pad with its nose pitched up at a high angle, allowing it to gradually descend to the ground under reduced power. During touchdown, the struts would compress by several feet, very much like a child's pogo stick does when it's pushed down. This would dampen the forces of impact on the plane, always remembering that it would have to land vertically with its nose facing up. In the event of an emergency, which could readily occur aboard a moving ship, especially in bad weather, the ventral fin could be jettisoned. This would allow the aircraft to make a crash landing using a more conventional, wing-supported mode of operation. I can't help but wonder what the pilot must have felt vibrating away into the sky. Well, thanks to today's video sponsor, you don't have to imagine Adam and Eve. I can't believe this sponsor, and I also can't believe this deal for 50% off one item. They have a 90-day no-hassle returns, and 20% of the profit goes to fight the spread of HIV around the world. To join your own Mile High Club at home, go to adamandeve.com and use code FOUND for 50% off one item plus free shipping in the US and Canada. Support the channel, keep the lights on, and experience your own turbulent free trip by exploring the link below. Back to the show. The Pogo had a maximum wingspan of 27.7 feet or 8.44 meters and a total wing area of 355 square feet or 108 square meters. But here's the kicker, it was only 34 feet or 10.6 meters in length topping out at 22 feet tall or 6.7 meters in height, making it a very compact plane indeed. That explains why it could only accommodate one pilot with a gross weight of 16,000 pounds or 7,300 kilograms. And how would the sole pilot be accommodated in an aircraft that flew both vertically and horizontally as part of normal operation? Designers realized that from an outset that safety and comfort were clearly needed for both flight regimes. To attain a vertical flight, the pilot's seat would have to rotate forward by 45 degrees, rotating back into place once horizontal flight was achieved. The seat would need to rotate again in order to facilitate the pilot being able to land with the tail of the aircraft directly behind him. By all accounts, pilot access into and out of the pogo was very awkward, as it required a special ladder for that. Weapons were never tested on the pogo, but one proposed configuration for armaments on board consisted of either 48 folding fin aerial rockets or a maximum of four 20mm cannons mounted in the Pogo's wingtips. So just how powerful would have this squat and stubby-shaped VTOL aircraft actually be? The Confair XFY Pogo would have been a very fast little plane. That's because it would have been powered by Allison YT-40A6 turboprop engines, which was capable of generating 5,850 horsepower. That made it the most powerful engine of its type outside the Soviet bloc at the time. The Ellison engine comprised of two T-38 power plants that were mounted side by side that fed their energy output into a single massive gearbox. All that power was delivered to two three-blade contra-rotating coaxial propellers, say that sentence three times fast, and that these two propellers were vital as the torque from a single propeller would have been 
insufficient for safe vertical takeoff or landing maneuvers. For good measure, an added boost was provided by the small amount of jet thrust from the Pogo's tailpipe. As for speeds, the Pogo at cruise at 35,000 feet could reach 592 miles or 952 kilometers per hour, but it's not actually its fastest altitude. That would be at 15,000 feet, with a maximum of 610 miles per hour or 981 kilometers per hour being possible which you'll know is faster than most commercial planes with their jet engines fly today. In terms of climb rate, the Confair Pogo could reach 10,000 feet in one minute and double that height in 2.7 minutes, with a surface ceiling of around 43,000 feet. However, Convair was not the only American aircraft manufacturer tasked with producing a VTOL for the US Navy. Another legendary American manufacturer was also selected to design a tail-sitting aircraft and would go head-to-head -head with this project. Lockheed Convair and Lockheed were effectively in competition with each other to produce the much-needed VTOL aircraft for the future of America's coastal defense. The US Navy had awarded them the contract in May 1951 after having spent four years conducting VTOL fighter feasibility studies. That had been the combination of a design study called Project Hummingbird, as well as what had been gleaned from material regarding Nazi Germany's thrust wing program, which is a future topic for this channel. Lockheed's effort was the XFV-1 and it's been universally agreed by aviation experts that Convair's XFY Pogo was by far the more successful project. The Convair XFY had not only been able to take off and land vertically, it had achieved the transition to horizontal flight and back to vertical on a number of occasions. Which brings us to the testing phase of the Pogo. Convair first successfully tested the engine in a vertical stand at Lindbergh Field in San Diego in February 1954. Two months later, it moved testing to the Moffett Field Naval Air Station, also in California, where a series of tethered flight tests were undertaken. James F. Skeets Coleman, a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Reserve and a Convair engineering test pilot, made the first tethered flight piloting the Pogo on April 29, 1954. The tethers in the form of multiple safety lines were there for a good reason. It was the first time that a propeller-driven aircraft of that size, weight and engine power would attempt the all-important vertical takeoff and landing. Coleman was able to complete over 60 hours of tethered flights inside of the hangar, although it was harrowing at times for the test pilot. Finally, the first untethered vertical flight outdoors was achieved on August 1st, 1954, to be followed up by several other tests in the future. That was continued on November 2nd by a successful transition from vertical to horizontal flight. The XFY-1 Pogo was able to fly horizontal in the open air for 20 minutes before safely landing inside of a 50-foot square. It was even able to hover for 7 minutes during that test. And this was an absolute game changer. That achievement would count as the first fully successful VTOL flight in history in an aircraft that wasn't a helicopter or an auto gyro. Coleman would later be awarded the prestigious Harmony Trophy for that feat alone. Interestingly, even the testing proved that the Pogo was damn fast. The XFY was able to easily attain speeds well over 300 miles or 483 kilometers per hour. Coleman was able to often outpace Chase aircraft, which had been assigned to monitor his testing. And that was achieved with the throttle on minimum power. So this aircraft ticked all the right boxes, it had a proven track record in testing, and the pilots loved its performance. Why was it never put into production? Returning back to our beginning of this video, we talked about the few benefits to developing a tail-sitting combat aircraft such as the Pogo. Taking up so little horizontal space on a deck meant that the aircraft wouldn't need a long concrete runway or a capacious aircraft carrier deck in order to take off or land. 
That space advantage also meant that a tail-sitting aircraft could effectively be deployed aboard any ship that was able to accommodate a helicopter. That feature alone would have made it a very versatile aircraft. However, as expected, landing that pogo was something else, requiring immense amounts of skill by the pilot. Also, the aircraft was not at all stable during hovering or when coming into land, requiring constant corrective actions on the pilot controls by the pilot. Also, the test pilot Coleman found it hugely difficult to judge his rate of descent accurately given how he was seated vertically and with a tail behind him. In the end, the Convair XFY Pogo was simply not meant to be. Coleman would make his last flight in the XFY on June 16, 1955. By then, interest and funding in the program by the Navy was fast disappearing as the focus had turned back to developing fixed-wing conventional fighters for aircraft carriers. The Navy axed the project six weeks later after the final test. There were simply too many concerns with the stability of the craft at slow or hovering speeds, not to mention the safety of the pilot. Nevertheless, the Convair XFY could still be proud of its achievements. It was able to fly for a total of 40 hours during testing in the open sky, and most important of all, it rightly earned itself the distinction of being the first VTOL aircraft in the history of aviation to attain a successful flight. For that alone, the plucky little Pogo is worth respect and even admiration. If you loved this little video today, I invite you to come and discuss it with me in the Discord. That's right, we have a Discord for this channel where you can come and chat with other fans about everything found and explained, aviation, and other top secret projects that never saw the light of day. We're growing fast, and I would love to have you among its members. And if you want to be more involved than just being a member of the Discord, then consider becoming a channel member or a Patreon today. You get to see videos early, help me decide which videos I should do next, and even get your name right here in the credits. So thanks again so much for watching.